the podcast of CBS This Morning will begin after this short break. The new State Farm Drive Safe and Save app could get you a discount up to 30% for good driving. But this State Farm radio ad gets you a 100% discount on this classic. If I could drive safe and save with higher rates, pass me by. Get a discount up to 30% with Drive Safe and Save. Just save some tonight. Discounts may vary. Not available in all states. I'm Gail King. I'm Anthony Mason. And I'm Tony DeCopel. And this is a CBS This Morning podcast. I'm Jan Crawford, CBS News' chief legal correspondent. Attorney General William Barr became President Donald Trump's second attorney general in February. It was Barr who supervised the conclusion and release of special counsel Robert Mueller's report. I met Barr in Anchorage, Alaska, for his first network television interview. Here is our conversation. Mr. Attorney General, thank you uh, very much for sitting down with us. Um, So obviously we saw the special counsel yesterday uh, make that statement. He analyzed 11 instances where there were possible obstruction uh, and then said that uh, he really couldn't make a decision, conclusion, on whether or not the president had, in fact, committed obstruction because of the existing OLC opinion in the legal counsel's office. Um, Do you agree with that interpretation, that that legal opinion prevented him from making a conclusion? Uh, I'm not sure he said it prevented him. I think what he said was he took that into account plus a number of other prudential judgments about fairness and other things and decided that the best course was not for him to reach a decision. Uh, I personally felt he could have reached the decision, but... Was there anything that would have stopped him in the regulations or in those, the, that opinion itself? He could have, re- in your view, he could have reached a conclusion. Right, he could have reached a conclusion. Uh, the opinion says you cannot indict a, a president while he's in office, but he could have reached a decision as to whether it was criminal activity, but uh, he had his reasons for not doing it, which he explained, and I'm not going to, you know, argue about those reasons, uh, but when he didn't make a decision, the Deputy Attorney General, Rod Rosenstein, and I felt it was necessary for us uh, as the heads of, uh, of the department to reach that decision. Uh, that's what the Department of Justice does. That's why we have the compulsory powers like a grand jury to force people to give us evidence so that we can determine whether a crime has been committed. And in order to legitimate the process, we felt we had to reach a decision. Well, I mean, he seemed to suggest yesterday that there was another venue for this, and that was Congress. Well, I'm I'm not sure what he was suggesting, but, you know, the Department of Justice doesn't use our powers of investigating crimes as an adjunct to Congress. Congress is a separate branch of government, and they can, you know, uh, they have processes. Uh, We have our processes. Ours are related to the criminal justice process. We're not an extension of Congress's investigative powers. Now, you have testified uh, that when you met with Mueller at the Justice Department, you had that meeting, that you were surprised when he told you then that he was not going to reach a conclusion on obstruction. Yes, uh, Rod and I were both surprised by that. Did you ask him, look, we need you to make a, a conclusion on this. You should make a conclusion. I, would, I wouldn't say I really pressed him on it. I was interested in his thinking on it, and he explained his position, said he was still thinking it through, and, and uh, uh, but I didn't really press him, uh, nor did Rod. So, but you left that meeting thinking that he wasn't going to have a conclusion. That's right. Do you feel because he didn't do that, I mean, did he fulfill his responsibility as special counsel? If you look at the regulations, it seems to anticipate that you would get a confidential report uh, explaining why he made a decision to either prosecute or decline to prosecute. And he didn't do that, it seems to me. Right, but on the other hand, he, he did provide us uh, a, a, f- a report and what he viewed to be the relevant facts, and uh, that allowed us, as the, uh, as the uh, leaders of the department, to make the decision. What's the fundamental difference? Why, I mean, he said that he couldn't exonerate the president, that he'd looked at the ev- there, these 11 instances of possible extraction, um, he couldn't exonerate the president. If he could, he would have stated so. You looked at that evidence, and you did. I mean, what's the fundamental difference between 
your view and his? Well, uh, I think Bob said that he was not going to engage in the analysis. He was, he was not going to make a determination one way or the other. Uh, and he also said that he could not say that the, the president was clearly did not violate the law, which, of course, is not the standard we use at the department. We have to determine whether there is c- clear violation of the law. And uh, so we applied the standards we would normally apply uh, we analyzed the law and the facts, and uh, a group of us uh, spent a lot of time doing that and determined that uh, both as a matter of law, many of the instances would not amount to obstruction. Uh, as a matter of law. As a matter of law. In other words, we didn't agree with the legal analysis, uh, a lot of the legal analysis in the report. It did not reflect the views of the department. It was the views of a particular lawyer or lawyers. Uh, and uh, so we applied uh, what we thought was the right law, but then we didn't rely on that. We also looked at all the facts, tried to determine whether the government could establish all the elements, and as to each of those episodes, we felt that the evidence was deficient. Before you became attorney general, you uh, wrote a memo to the Justice Department looking at the, the, the question of and the legal standards for obstruction and suggesting that the president has the authority to say back off of the Flynn investigation, could have fired James Comey under his executive authority. How much, I mean, when you're talking about, I mean, can you explain that a little more when you're talking about your judgment that no obstruction occurred based on the evidence uh, that Mueller produced and your understanding of the law. Can you explain a little more why wasn't that obstruction? Well, let's take, uh, let's take the firing of Comey, for example. Uh, I think we would have said as a matter of law, and I'm not relying on my legal, uh, my legal memo that I wrote as a private citizen, but uh, really on the views within the department of the people who think about these things and are responsible for framing the views of the department. And I think we would have said that as a matter of law, the obstruction statutes do not reach facially valid exercises of core presidential authority or official authority, even decisions by the attorney general in administering uh, the executive branch or litigation. But we didn't rely on that. Uh, We then looked at that uh, issue. Let's take again the the firing of Comey. One of the elements is that you have to show uh, that the act, objectively speaking, will have the probable effect of obstructing a proceeding. And we, d- we don't believe that the firing of an agency head could be established as having the probable effect, objectively speaking, of sabotaging a proceeding. There was also, we would have to prove corrupt intent. The report itself points out that, that one of the likely uh, motivations here was the president's frustration that Comey saying something publicly and saying a different thing privately and refusing to correct the record. So that would not have been a corrupt intent. So for each of these episodes, we thought long and hard about it. We looked at the facts, and we didn't feel the government could establish uh, obstruction in these cases. When you um, see some of the criticism, and you've gotten quite a bit of it, uh, that you're protecting the president, that you're enabling the president, what's your response to that? Well, uh, I th- we live in a hyper-partisan age where people no longer really pay attention to the substance of what's said, but as to who says it and what side they're on and what its political ramifications are. Uh, the Department of Justice is all about the law and the facts and the substance, and I'm going to make the decisions based on the law and the facts, and I realize that's in tension with the political climate we live in because people are more interested in getting their way politically. Uh, So I think it just goes with the territory of being attorney general in a hyper-partisan period of time. The four-page summary that you wrote, did you ask in that March 5th meeting uh, for the special counsel to kind of redact all the grand jury material? Yes. Uh, Not redact it, but highlight it so we could redact it. We would have... uh, so. You know, the report was over 400 pages. I I knew that it was going to be voluminous and coming our way in a few weeks. Uh, My intent was to get out as much as I could as quickly as I could. Uh, To do that, I would have to, as a matter of law, make sure that grand jury material was redacted because regardless of the political posturing that's going on, 
it's not lawful for me to just make that public. Not even to Congress. Not you even couldn't to, even give Congress, which of course is demanding that and threatening to hold you in contempt because you're not giving them the full report. That's right. And so but by law you can't. Right. And so because we were not involved in the investigation, we would have no way looking at the report of determining what was grand jury material and what wasn't. So we had for a period of weeks been asking the special counsel's office to highlight this stuff so we could quickly process it for release. And I guess so wait, for a period of weeks you had asked for this. Yeah, material. even before the March fifth meeting we had asked uh, and what was or, or raised raise, raise the subject and then at the March 5th meeting I made it explicit and then after the March 5th meeting we asked. And what uh, was the response? We thought it was being, we thought it was being done and, and I do believe that they were putting more footnotes in that would be necessary ultimately in identifying the material but uh, whether the, the wires were crossed or whatever it didn't come in a form that identified the 6E material. Which and that was a surprise to you when you got the report? Y yes. It was. And it, and it immediately meant that, that uh, you know, it was going to be a period of weeks before we could get the report out. If I had my druthers, I would have liked to get the report out as quickly as possible. So instead you turned this four-page summary? Right, because I, I didn't think the body politic would allow us to go on radio silence for four weeks. I mean, people were camped outside my house and the department, and every uh, there was all kinds of wild speculation going on. Former senior intelligence officials who were purporting to have it, or intimating that they had inside information were suggesting that the president and his family were going to be indicted and so forth. And saying that publicly. Saying that publicly. There was all kinds and of wild... And you knew that to be false. Yes, and it was wild and irresponsible uh, speculation going on, which the wild very... and irresponsible the the former intelligence officials speculation. right and, and 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 talking heads and things like that, and these things affect uh, the United States' ability to function in the world. We have a economy; it could affect the economy. It can affect uh, it can affect our foreign relations during very delicate period of time with you know serious adversaries in the world. So I felt. Uh, that in order to buy time, in order to get the report out, I had to state the bottom line, just like you're announcing a verdict in a case. My purpose there was not to summarize every jot and tittle of the report and every, uh, you know, uh, angle that, that, that Mueller looked into, but uh, just state the bottom line, which I did in the four-page memo. You didn't say in that four-page memo that the report would not exonerate the president on obstruction, that line. That I said that, yes. In, the, in, the, I, in my four-page memo, I said that uh, Mueller uh, did not reach a decision. He, he gave both sides. And, that, and then I quoted that sentence, which is, while we didn't find a crime, uh, we didn't exonerate the president. That was in the four-page letter. The did not, we would so clearly state the preface to that. Yeah. That that was not in there and there was some criticism that in the summary and and the attorney I mean the special counsel himself wrote the letter saying people are misunderstanding there's been some confusion that the summary had caused some confusion right, right. that perhaps and, and he didn't say this but the the, the response was that uh, you were too soft on the president that actually the special counsel was a little sharper on obstruction well, again, I wasn't tr trying to provide all the flavor and nooks and crannies of the, of the report. I was just trying to state the bottom line. And the bottom line was that Bob Mueller identified some episodes. He, he did not reach a conclusion. He provided both sides of the issue. And he, his conclusion was he wasn't exonerating the president, but he wasn't finding a crime either. And uh, for, for the purposes at the point, I think that that was uh, what was required for the body politic because actually most of the letter then goes on to explain how Rod Rosenstein and I uh, reached a decision and the criteria we applied in finding no obstruction. Um, he wrote the letter uh, taking issue, saying that they'd ca you'd caused confusion. Mm -hmm. Did that catch you off guard? Yeah, sure. I, I was surprised he just didn't pick up the phone and call me, given our 30-year relationship. But Why didn't he? I don't, I don't know, but uh, as I said in the hearing, I thought it was a, the letter was a little snitty and probably staff-driven. Staff-driven. Um, yeah, I personally felt, but, but we had a good conversation. Because otherwise you would have picked up the phone? and Right, well, which I did, and we had a good conversation. And uh, uh, 
I think the, I think the matter has now uh, been fully <laughs> vetted, and 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 I think uh, uh, he he was concerned that that there should be more context and texture to his work given, and that in the absence of that, uh, the vacuum had been filled with you know media reports that were then causing confusion, and he wanted it clarified by putting more of an explanation of his reasoning out. And uh, I, I said that uh, I didn't want to put out dribs and drabs. I wanted the whole report out. And I, then I wrote a letter again to Congress saying, look, uh, I, this is not intended to be a full summary. Bob's thinking is reflected in the report. Everyone's going to have access to it. They should look at that to determine uh, you know what Bob's reasoning was. So uh, that's where we let it sit until the report was released. I just want to, before we move on to the next topic, you said that you had wanted to release the report in full, and you largely have, with the grand jury material being, of course, the right. exception. And, and in the second volume, that's one-tenth of one percent of the report has been taken. You, I just to be clear on this, how long and how many, you expected the special counsel's office to redact that material, or, so, or, yeah. to, to point out what right. should be redacted. Right. How... So the four-page summary would have been unnecessary. Correct. You expect, could you just tell us again, you expected to get the report with the grand jury material identified, and then what was your plan? My plan was to figure out how long it would take us to redact what had to be redacted. And what did you anticipate that would be? And, and if, we could readily, uh, if we could readily identify the 6E material, I thought we could do it in, in a, you know, less than a week. Uh, and if I'd been looking at a matter of days like that, then I would probably have just told people what the timeline is uh, so people knew when it would be coming out, when they would see it. Uh, but uh, once I realized it was going to take three or four weeks, I, I felt I had to say something in the interim. But if you'd had that material pointed out, mm -hmm. this would have all been different. You wouldn't have written the four-page summary? Probably not. I guess it, just to, to finish up on this topic then, when, when we saw uh, the special counsel yesterday, uh, you put out the statement that there wasn't really any kind of discrepancy in, in some of the yeah, things that we, you had been saying. We, bo we both put out the yeah. statement, yeah. Um, was that the first time there's been a joint statement? Yes. And why was that? I believe, I believe so. Why was that necessary? Well, because I think there were some people who uh, wouldn't let the facts interfere with their narrative uh, and were trying to suggest that there was a difference of opinion about the role played by the OLC opinion, which simply wasn't true. The difference is your views on obstruction and... Well, the, the difference was this. Oh, so I understand what you're yeah, saying. I, yeah. I, guess, I guess you focused on what the role the OLC opinion played right. in the statement. The so-called discrepancy was that I had I had testified earlier uh, that uh, Bob had assured me that he had not reached a decision that there was a crime committed, but was not willing to pursue it simply because of the OLC opinion, and that remains the fact. He that's what his position is that consistent with what he said yesterday, and it certainly is consistent with the joint release we put out. The, the confusion arose because uh, what Bob Mueller's position was, was that the OLC opinion coupled with other things as a prudential matter made him feel that he shouldn't even get into the analysis of whether something was a crime or not. And right, that's, just that's a different you, question than, yeah. Just because uh, there's evidence uh, of obstruction or a crime is committed doesn't mean the person is going to be charged or indicted or found right, to have committed he, that crime. Right, and he didn't even get into that analysis. In other words, what I was discussing earlier was, was Bob, did Bob make a decision that there was a crime? And the only reason he wasn't saying that was because of the OLC opinion. The fact is, Bob did not make a decision that there was a crime. He didn't get into the analysis at all. Part of the reason for that was his judgment about the OLC opinion coupled with other things. He just didn't think it was a proper exercise of his authority. So a totally different issue, and that's why, that's why uh, both of us feel that this idea that uh, there's been a, a discrepancy over the OLC opinion is simply wrong.
Did you watch uh, him give the statement yesterday? Uh, I watched a rerun of it. Yeah. Anything new or different? No, I mean, I, I, for, I, I, to me, it, it, it uh, was a reiteration of, of some of the key elements of his report. I think he wanted to stress a number of things uh, that were in the report. Uh, there had been uh, a lot of commentary about his, about his work. I had made some critical remarks about it. So I, I think it's quite understandable. He wanted to hammer home a few of the key points that were in the report, and I thought that that was fine. He said he's not going to be testifying. That's right. Uh, do you think he should? Uh, you know, I think, it, I, as I said, you know, it's, it's up to Bob, but I think the line he's drawing, which is that he's going to stick to what he said in the report, is the proper line for any department official. But you've testified under oath, asked quest answered questions under oath. He took no questions yesterday. Is that sufficient? I th yes, I think it's sufficient because, you know, he was handling a specific investigation, and normally we don't wheel out our prosecutors and have them interrogated about how they handled a particular case. But you wouldn't have objected if he wanted to testify? I wouldn't have objected if he, if he wanted to testify. I, I do think that his view that he should uh, stick to what is in the report is consistent with the department's view of these things. Um, so the last thing that he said yesterday um, was to remind us that Russia uh, tried to sway our election. Um, and he said there were multiple systematic efforts to interfere, and that deserves the attention of every American. Mm -hmm. um, how is the Justice Department working now to ensure this doesn't happen again in 2020? Yes, well, you know, we, we do have, a, I think, an a increasingly robust program uh, that is focusing on foreign influence in our election process. The FBI obviously has the lead in that, and I've been briefed on it on a regular basis, uh, and I think it's a, it's a very impressive effort, but we are ramping up. Uh, I talked recently to the, the director of the FBI about... Uh, putting together a special uh, high-level group uh, to, to uh, make sure we're totally prepared for the upcoming elections. And the high-level group would be, who would that include? Well, you know, it would include the FBI, the Department of Justice, DHS, uh, and intelligence agencies. Do you think enough was done in 2016? I don't, uh, enough was done in 2016? Uh, probably not. Uh, you know, I think Bob Mueller did some impressive work uh, in his investigation, you know, identifying uh, some of the Russian hackers uh, and their uh, influence campaign. And you sort of wonder if that kind of work had been done starting <laughs> in 2016. Right, Things could have been a lot different. It's just hard to understand why it wasn't taken more seriously. Right. Why, why do you think it was? Not. I have no idea. That's one of the things I'm interested in looking at. Um, you know, uh, as part of the review. Yes. In other words, uh, you know, there are statements being made that people were alarmed back in April, and of uh, 2016. Right. And and I don't uh, have any reason to doubt that, but I'm wondering what exactly was the response to it if they were alarmed. Surely the response should have been more than just you know, dangling a confidential informant in front of a peripheral player in the, the Trump campaign. I want to talk to you about the investigation um, because you're that's you're suggesting that was obviously inadequate. But when you talk to uh, Director Ray about appointing this high-level group and efforts to ensure that this doesn't happen again in 2020, um, has he expressed any concern to you that kind of re the review that you're now going to undertake or this investigation of the investigation, that that could hamper uh, these efforts in, uh, 20, in 2020. We've discussed how important it is that that not be allowed to happen, and we're both very cognizant of that. And You've discussed that with him? Oh, yes. And, you know, I think he's being very supportive, and we're working together on, on you know, trying to reconstruct what happened. I mean, people have to understand, you know, one of the things here is that these efforts in 2016, these counterintelligence activities that were directed at the Trump campaign were not done in the normal course and not through the normal procedures, as far as I can tell. And uh, a lot of the people who were involved are no longer there. So, uh, 
So when, when we're talking about the um, kind of the, well, you've used the word spying. Mm -hmm. You've testified that you believe spying occurred yes. into the Trump campaign. Yes. Um, you've gotten some criticism for using that word. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's become a dirty word somehow. It has not never been for me. I think there's nothing wrong with spying. The question is always whether it's authorized by law uh, and properly predicated. And uh, if it is, then it's an important tool the United States has to protect the country. The, on using the word, I mean, do you understand, and I know that some of the, I know some former intelligence chiefs have said, the president has made that word somewhat pejorative, uh, that they're spying, that this is a witch hunt, this is a hoax. And so your use of that word makes it seem that you're uh, being a loyalist. Uh, you know, it's part of the craziness of the modern day that if a president uses a word, then all of a sudden it becomes off bounds. It's a perfectly good English word. I'll continue to use it. <laughs> you're saying that spying occurred. There's not anything necessarily wrong with that, as long as there's a reason for it. If, whether it's adequately predicated. And look, I, I think if we, if we, why are we worried about foreign influence in a campaign? We should be, because uh, the heart of our system is the peaceful transfer of power through elections, and and what gives the government legitimacy is that process. And if foreign elements can come in and affect it, that's bad for the republic and it uh, but by the same token it's just as as just as dangerous to the uh, you know continuation of self-government in our republican system but republic uh, that we not allow government power law enforcement or intelligence power to play a role in politics to intrude into politics and to affect elections so, so it's just as dangerous so when we talk about uh, foreign interference versus, a, say, a, a government abuse of power mm -hmm. in the U.S., which is more troubling? Well, they're both, they're both troubling. Um, Equally? In, in my mind, they are, sure. I mean, republics have fallen because of Praetorian Guard mentality, where government officials uh, get very arrogant. They identify uh, the national interest with their own political preferences, and they feel that anyone who, uh, you know, has a different opinion, uh, you know, is somehow uh, an enemy of the state. And, uh, you know, there is that tendency that they know better uh, and, uh, you know, that they're there to protect as guardians uh, of the people. That can easily translate into essentially uh, supervening the will of the majority and getting your own way as a, as a government official. And you have concern that they may have happened in 2016? Well, I just think it has to be carefully looked at uh, because the use of uh, foreign intelligence capabilities and counterintelligence capabilities against an American political campaign to me is unprecedented, and it's a serious red line that's been crossed. Did and that happen? There were, there were counterintelligence activities undertaken against the Trump campaign. And uh, that's, I'm not saying that there was not a basis for it that was legitimate. I want to see what that basis was and make sure it was legitimate. I, that's one of the, you know, one of the key functions of the attorney general, core responsibilities of the attorney general, is to make sure that government power is not abused uh, and that the rights of Americans uh, are not transgressed by uh, abuse of government power. That's the responsibility of the attorney general. You know, the, I guess we've spent like the last two years or more talking about and hearing about Russian influence in the elections and uh, what occurred there. And so now we're shifting to talking about actually investigating, reviewing that investigation and the people who did that. Um, so I guess in making this turn, I mean, can you help us understand I mean, what's, what is the concern? What have you seen? I mean, what's the basis for that? Well, I don't want to get, you know, too much into, into the facts because it's still under review. But um, I think it's important to understand um, what basis there was for launching counterintelligence activities against the political campaign, which is the core of, of First Amendment uh, liberties in this country. And... 
what was the predicate for it? How, what was the hurdle that had to be crossed? What was the process? Who had to approve it? Um, and uh, including the electronic surveillance, whatever electronic surveillance was done. And was everyone operating in their proper lane? Um, and I've selected, uh, you know, a terrific career prosecutor from the department who's been there over 30 years. He's now the U.S. attorney. Uh, but he has, over the years, been used by both Republican and Democratic attorney generals uh, to investigate these kinds of activities, and he's always uh, gotten the most, uh, you know, laudatory uh, uh, feedback from his work. So there's no doubt in my mind that he's going he's gonna to conduct a thorough and fair uh, review of this. And we're working closely with the intelligence agencies, the, the Bureau and the agency and others, to help us reconstruct what happened. Um, and I want to see what, what are the standards that were applied, what was the evidence, uh, what were the techniques used, who approved them, what was there a legitimate basis for it. The Inspector General is looking at only, it's my understanding, a small part of this. Is that correct? The FISA warrant? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say small, but uh, he's looking at a discrete area that is that is uh, you know important, which is the use of electronic surveillance that was targeted at Carter Page. And could he have just? Could you have just said, "I want to expand this investigation"? Why did you feel it was necessary to turn to to John Durham? Well, the Inspector General at the Department, uh, Mike Horowitz, who you know is, is a superb uh, government official. Uh, he has limited powers. He doesn't have the power to compel testimony. He doesn't have the power uh, really to investigate beyond the current uh, cast of characters at the Department of Justice, his ability to get information from former uh, officials or from other agencies outside the department is very limited. Uh, so so he wouldn't have been able to go and try to speak with some of the former officials who are making these decisions necessarily? Right if they're not in the department anymore. Right. Um, what's the status of uh, Huber's investigation in Utah? I think the former Attorney General Sessions had asked him to look at this. Right, so H Huber uh, had originally been asked to take a look at the FISA applications and the electronic surveillance, but then he stood back and put that on hold while the Office of Inspector General was conducting its review, which would have been normal for the department. And he was essentially on standby in case uh, Mr. Horowitz referred a matter to him to be handled criminally. So he has not been active on this front uh, in, in recent uh, months, and so uh, Durham is taking over that role. Um, the other issues he's been working on relate to Hillary Clinton. Uh, those are winding down and hopefully we'll be in a position to bring those to fruition. So he won't be involved in this really at all then? No. This is his role is done. Right. And now Durham's going to pick up yes. this. And, right. Um, so again, just to go, just so I think so people can more fully understand this. I mean, have you, and I know it's early in the investigation, but when we're talking about the basis for this and why you think it's important, and obviously... Uh, any kind of government abuse of power. I mean, you were in the CIA in the 70s. Right. Uh, you can see how that can have... Quite... Right. When I, you know, I, I joined the CIA almost 50 years ago as an intern, and this was during the Vietnam uh, civil rights era, and there had been a lot of... Inv there were a lot of pending investigations of the CIA. And, and there, there, the issues were, you know, what, what was it, when was it appropriate for intelligence agencies? The FBI, too, was under investigation. You know, the penetration of civil rights groups, because at the time there was concerns about contacts with, you know, communist-funded front groups and things like that. And, you know, how, how deeply could you get into civil rights groups or anti-Vietnam War groups? A lot of these groups were in contact with uh, foreign adversaries. They had some... Uh, contact with front organizations and so forth and and there were a lot of rules put in place and those rules are under the Attorney General. Uh, the Attorney General's responsibility is to make sure that these powers are not used to uh, tread upon First Amendment activity and 
uh, that certainly was, was a big part of my formative years of dealing with those issues. The fact that today people just seem to brush aside the idea that it's okay to, uh, you know, to engage in these activities against a political campaign is stunning to me, especially when the media doesn't seem to think that it's worth looking into. They're supposed to be the watchdogs of, uh, you know, our civil liberties. What have you seen? What evidence? What makes you think, I need to take a look at this? I mean, what have you seen in the summer of 2016? Um, well, I'll say at this point is that, you know, I, 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 like many other people who are familiar with intelligence activities, I had a lot of questions about what was going on, and I assumed that I'd, I'd get answers when I went in, and I have not gotten answers that are at all satisfactory and, and in fact, have probably more questions, and that some of the facts uh, that, that I've learned uh, don't hang together with the official explanations of what happened. What do you mean by that? That's, that's all I really will say. Things are just not jiving, and I'm not saying at this stage that... Was it a timeline? I mean, you, there's is there time, concern there's, that there's this may have off. happened before uh, the, we realized that the investigation was initiated in July? I mean, what... I, I, I don't want to get into those details at this point. I would just say that, you know... Uh, but you said there's a timeline concern. Uh, well, I, I, won't, I won't confirm that, but I'll just say that, uh, you know, there, there are some questions that I think have to be answered, and, and I, have a, I have a basis for feeling that there has to be a review of this. Um, you've, said, you've said the time frame between the election and the inauguration, you've said this publicly, was kind of strange. Mm -hmm. Some strange things may have happened. What concerns you there? Specifically the meeting at Trump Tower. I don't want to. I don't want to get into that. Okay. Um, so, kind of going back to what we were talking about with uh, uh, Director Ray. I mean, obviously, you've seen this. Like, people are raising concerns that this is going to undermine an FBI morale. Um, you know, the rank and file. Uh, what are we saying here? But you said in recent uh, Senate testimony, this is not launching an investigation of the FBI. Frankly, to the extent there were any issues at the FBI, I do not view it as a problem that's endemic to the FBI. I think there was probably a failure among a group of leaders there at the upper echelon. That's right. So there was probably a failure among a group of leaders there at the upper, upper echelon. Right. In other words, I, I, I don't uh, believe this is a problem you know, rife through the, through the Bureau. Uh, that but what suggests to you there was a failure in the upper echelon at the FBI? Because I think the activities were undertaken by uh, a small group at the top, which is one of the, probably the mistakes that has been made instead of running this as a normal uh, bureau investigation or counterintelligence investigation. It was done, it was done by the executives at the senior, senior level. And, and you're talking about out of James Comey, Yeah, I'm just McCabe. not going to get into the individual names at this point. But I, I just view that it, I, I don't view it as a, as a, bureau-wide issue. And I will say the same thing for other intelligence agencies. Uh, and, and they're being very cooperative, helping us. They're being cooperative. Yes. You're working with uh, the DNI, uh, the head of the CIA. I want to ask you about some of this declassification, but the, the president has tweeted um, and said publicly that some of those in the upper echelon, Comey, McCabe, et cetera, uh, committed treason. Well, I, uh, I mean, word, do you agree with that? Well, I, as a lawyer, I always interpret the word treason not colloquially but legally, and you know the very specific criteria for treason. So I don't think it's actually implicated in the situation we have now. But I think what legally, he, it's you, right. you don't think that they've committed treason. Not as a legal matter, right? But you have concerns about. how they conducted the investigation. Yes, but, you know, when you're dealing with official government contact, in, intent is frequently a murky issue. Uh, I'm not suggesting people uh, did what they did necessarily because of uh, conscious nefarious motives. Sometimes people can convince themselves that what they're doing is in the, the higher interest, the better good. 
they don't realize that what they're doing is really antithetical to the democratic system we have. They start viewing themselves as the guardians of the people that are more informed and sensitive than everybody else. And they can, in their own mind, they can have uh, those kinds of motives. And sometimes uh, they can look at evidence and facts uh, through a biased prism that they themselves don't realize, that something objectively uh, as applied as a neutral principle across the board really you know, shouldn't be the standard used in the case, but because they have a particular bias, they don't see that. So that's why procedures and standards are important. And review afterward is an important way of making sure that government power is being conscientiously uh, and properly applied. It doesn't necessarily mean that there are people, you know, that, that people who have crossed lines have done so with corrupt intent or anything like that. But it seems like you have a concern that there may have been uh, bias by top officials, say in the FBI, um, as they looked at whether or not to launch and conduct this investigation. Well, it's hard to read some of the texts with, uh, and not feel that there was gross bias at work, and uh, they're appalling. And if the shoe appalling. were on, uh, they're, they're, those, those are appalling, and on their face uh, are very uh, damning. Uh, and I think if the shoe was under on the other foot, we'd be hearing a lot about it. If, if that, those kinds of discussions were held, you know, uh, when Obama first ran for office, people talking about Obama in those tones and suggesting, you know, that he might be a, you know, Manchurian candidate for Islam or something like that, uh, you know, some wild accusations like that, and you had that kind of uh, discussion back and forth, you don't think we would be hearing a lot more about it? You, um, I guess when, when you say that there were things done that were not the typical run of business, ad hoc, small group, it's not how these counterintelligence operations normally work, I think that maybe Comey and others might say, well, this was such an extraordinary thing, we had to keep it so closely held. So we had to do it differently. What's your response to that? Well, Is that legit? It might be legit under certain circumstances, but a lot of that has to do with how good the evidence was at that point. And, you know, Mueller has spent two and a half years, and the fact is there is no evidence of a conspiracy. So it was bogus. This whole idea that Trump was in cahoots with the Russians is bogus. Did you ask the president for authority to declassify? Yes. You asked the president? Yes. And also you know, the, the direction of the intelligence agencies to support our efforts. So have you discussed this with the, the, uh, the, the DNI and head of the CIA? And, yes. And they, what, what's their response? That they're going to be supportive. Yeah. And so you won't, will you declassify things without reviewing it with them? It seems like you have the authority to do that. Well, in, in an exceptional circumstance, I have that authority, but obviously uh, I intend to consult with them. You know, I... I, I'm amused by these people who make a living by disclosing <laughs> classified information, including the names of intelligence operatives, wringing their hands about whether I'm going to be responsible in protecting intelligence sources and methods. I've been in, in the business, as I said, for over 50 years, well, before they were born, and uh, I know how to handle classified information, and I believe strongly in protecting intelligence sources and methods, but at the same time, if there is information that can be shared with the American people uh, without jeopardizing intelligence sources and methods, that decision should be made. And because I will be involved in finding out what the story was, I think I'm in the best position to make that decision. I know you've seen some of the criticism and the pushback on, on this. Are, do you have any concerns that doing this investigation, talking about declassifying certain materials, that that's undermining your credibility, the credibility of the department? No, I, I, I don't. I think it's actually the reaction is somewhat strange. I mean, normally... Strange. Their sure. reaction. Well, the media reaction is strange. Normally the media would be interested in letting the sun shine in and finding out what the truth is. And usually the media doesn't care that much about protecting intelligence sources and methods. But I do, and I will. All right. Um... You're only the second attorney general in history who served twice. I think the first one was back in 1850. Right. Um, but you're working for a man who is, I mean, you're an establishment figure in a way. You've had a long career in Washington. 
um, but you're working for a man who's not establishment. Uh, and some of his tweets about uh, officials and the rule of law, um, how do you react when you see those? Are you on Twitter? Do you read his tweets? No, I'm not on Twitter. Um, and every once in a while a tweet is brought to my attention. But uh, my experience with the president is we have a, we have a good working relate, professional working relationship. We're, we, you know, we talk to each other, and if he has something to say to me, uh, I figure he'll tell me directly. I don't look to tweets for, you know, uh, I don't look at them as directives or as official uh, communications with, with the department. But when you came into this job, you, you, you were kind of, it's like the U.S. attorney in Connecticut. I mean, you had a, a good reputation on the right and on the left. Uh, you know, you were a, a man with a good reputation. Uh, you're now someone who is, you know, accused of protecting the president, enabling the president, uh, lying to Congress. Uh, did you expect that coming in? in and what's your response to it? How do you, how do, what's your response to that? Well, in a way, I did expect it. You because, did? Yeah, because I realized we live in a, a crazy, hyper-partisan period of time, and I knew that uh, it would only be a matter of time if, you, if I was behaving responsibly and calling them as I see them, uh, that I'd be attacked, because nowadays people don't care about the merits or the substance. They only care about who it helps, you know, who benefits, whether my side benefits or the other side benefits. Everything is gauged by politics. And uh, as I say, that's antithetical to the way the department runs. And any attorney general in this period is going to end up losing a lot of political capital. And I realized that. And that's one of the reasons that I ultimately was persuaded that maybe I should take it on, because I, I, I think at my stage in life, it really doesn't make any difference. Uh, You're at the end of your career? Or? I'm at the end of my career. I've, you know. I, Does it, but, I mean, it's a reputation that you've worked your whole life on, though. Yeah, but everyone dies, and I'm not, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I don't believe in the Homeric idea that, you know, immortality comes by, you know, having odes sung about you <laughs> over the centuries, you know. So you don't regret taking the job? No. Not even today? I'd rather, in many ways, I'd rather be back to my old life, but I think that um, I love the Department of Justice, I love the FBI, uh, I think it's important that we not, in, in this period of intense partisan feeling, uh, destroy our institutions. I think one of the ironies today is that people are saying that it's President Trump that's shredding our institutions. I really see no evidence of that. It's hard for, and I, and I really haven't seen a bill of particulars as to how that's being done. From my perspective, the idea of resisting a democratically elected president and basically throwing everything at him and, and you know, uh, really changing the norms on the grounds that we have to stop this president. That's where the shredding of our, of our norms and our institutions is occurring. And you think that happened even with the investigation into the campaign, I potentially? Want, I'm concerned about that. Thank you for listening to the CBS This Morning podcast. Be sure to subscribe to get your morning news in under 20 minutes and daily podcast originals. You can watch the CBS This Morning broadcast Monday through Saturday from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. on your local CBS station or live on the CBS All Access app.